I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight begins what we call the tritium. The tritium comes from the Latin word for three, right? And the tritium is three nights in a row, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday. Three nights, but really it's one service. Did you know that you were committing yourselves to one service that's over the course of three nights? And think about it. If you look at the beginning of the service, there's the opening, what we call the opening acclamation, right? Um, Blessed is the Lord who forgives our sins. Um, But if you look at the end of this service, there's no dismissal. And next, tomorrow night, at, at the Good Friday service, there's no opening acclamation and there's no dismissal. We won't get a proper dismissal until the end of the Easter vigil. We won't get a proper blessing until the end of the Easter vigil. So you are on the crazy train, and there is no getting off until we arrive at the station. There's something really incredibly powerful about these three nights. Uh, I, my, my, one of my professors in seminary said, never tell your parishioners this, but an entire year's worth of church is crammed into the tritium, those three nights. And, and it's true. I mean, it, it, these are the most elaborate services. These are the most striking services, all the symbols and the sights and the sounds and the smells. I mean, this is what church is all about. If we were Eastern Orthodox, we'd do the Easter vigil all night long. And we'd go in, take a nap, have some hummus, and then come back and keep going. We're not going to do that. Don't worry. But you get the point. This, this, is, this is so, so important and so wonderful and so life-giving, even as the themes and the story and, and, and as we, we um, hear about the passion of Christ, it's also heartbreaking, right? And so tonight is Monday, Thursday... And the, the origin of that word, Monday, um, you know, it's confusing because some people think it's Mo- Monday, Thursday, and, and that's not right. Um, now, Monday comes from the Latin word uh, mandatum, right, as in mandate. So, in the Latin of the New Testament, um, Jesus institutes a novum mandatum, right, a new mandate, or as our translation puts it, a new mandate commandment. In that, the end of that gospel reading that we just heard, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, a new mandate that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, Jesus says, you also should love one another, and by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And so tonight is, we celebrate this new mandate. And I was thinking about that word and how it's used um, in, in wider culture, not in, in the church, not on Monday, Thursday. And I was thinking about how, um, especially during election years, that word mandate has a, a political connotation, right? In fact, there is, if you look up the word mandate in the dictionary, there is a, a definition that says in parentheses, political, right? So a political mandate um, is this. In representative democracies, a mandate is a perceived legitimacy to rule through popular support. A perceived legitimacy, right? Mandates are conveyed through elections. And so we all know that that when a politician is elected, and especially if it's by a wide margin, then they feel like they have a mandate to begin those policies or to continue those policies that they ran their campaign on. Right? Um, so politicians might feel whether the, the election is um, a valid election or not. Politicians might feel like if they're elected, then they have a mandate to start wars or continue wars. I was thinking also of, uh, have you ever heard Bono's version of the Ave Maria? I promise this is all going like, to come, come together in the end. Bono, the, the lead singer of U2, also a devout Anglican like us, has a version of, of Ave Maria. You should go and later YouTube it with Bono Pavarotti 
Ave Maria, and it'll come up, and it's, it's really great. Um, but Bono, of course, has to make up his own words. Uh, he doesn't sing the Latin, but the, here are the words that, that Bono sings. Ave Maria, where is the justice in this world? The wicked make so much noise, mother, while the righteous stay oddly still. With no wisdom, all of the riches of the world leave us poor tonight. And strength is not without humility, it's weakness in untreatable disease. War is always the choice of the chosen who will not have to fight. I'm just thinking about that. With this, this mandate that comes from an election, you, we elect leaders and they may choose to go to war, but they're not the ones who have to fight. They are the chosen ones, the ones who remain safe, the ones who have the power, who have the wealth, and they send others to fight their battles for them. That, of course, is a story as old as the age, the, you know, the old, old as time, right? It's the, the, as old as civilization itself. But Jesus' mandate is a new mandate, a new commandment. And Jesus' mandate to rule is different. The only election that counts, or perhaps the one that counts the most, is how God in Christ elected to be one of us. As a result, we, through baptism, are elected to become children of God. And so the, the mandate that we have is through that election and no other. It's through the election of love that God sent God's Son to be one of us. He chose to be one of us, to live like us, and to die at our hands. That is the election that gives Jesus the mandate to rule. You heard it in the gospel reading. He says, I am, you call me teacher and Lord, and that is true. I am Lord. Jesus' mandate to rule, though, is legitimized through service. It's legitimized through humility, and it's legitimized through love. Jesus is Lord, and at the very moment when he is most like the Lord, the very moment when he, the Gospel of John says, is glorified, is the moment that he takes off his robes and kneels down and washes his disciples' feet as a servant. That is Jesus' mandate to rule. That is what it means to rule in the kingdom of God. Not with armies, not with people that you can send out to fight your own battles for you, but as a man who is willing to humble himself for the sake of love. A man who is God, who is willing to humble himself and take up the cross and die for the sake of the whole world. John says, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And so, in our, in our readings, we, so Paul kind of fills it in for us. This is the Last Supper, right? John's story of the Last Supper actually doesn't focus on supper very much. John's story focuses on the foot washing. John's John's story has this long prayer that Jesus, a prayer of love um, that Jesus prays over his disciples. And, and the, the meal is, and it also focuses on the psychology of, of some of the people, right? It focuses on what Judas was doing. It focuses on Peter. It focuses on um, Jesus's what, thought processes and all of that. But the meal itself, we know from the other gospels, and we know we read uh, the, the reading from Corinthians about how on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he instituted the Eucharist, and he took the bread and he said, this is my body. He took the wine and said, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you come together, do this in remembrance 
of me. And so tonight, we, Jesus institutes for us on Monday, Thursday, on the first Monday, Thursday, he institutes for us two sacramental acts, the foot washing and the Eucharist. Both are instituted this night as Christian practices, but neither of them have any legitimacy at all without that new mandate affected through the election of God. They have no legitimacy without love. They are both sacraments or symbols that participate in the truth that they symbolize, but the truth that they symbolize is love. That is the truth. That is why we are gathered here 2,000 years after the first Monday Thursday, because the truth of Jesus' power, the truth of the reason why he came to earth, the truth of the meaning of all of life, the truth that is greater than death, is love. God's love for us that empowers us to love each other. And so tonight we're going to do this really weird, awkward thing. And I wore my sandals, kind of squeaky, um, but it's because, you know, I, I don't want to put my socks back on. So we're going to do this weird, awkward thing. And then we're going to do another thing that we do a lot, but is, is, if you think about it, it's pretty weird. You know, we, we sing, um, and, and I know it makes us uncomfortable, the, we say and we sing, this is Christ's flesh and we're going to eat it, right? And that's, and that's a little... Um, it's a little crazy if you think about it. But they are both symbols that participate in the reality of God's love for us. And they are both practices that we do that help us to learn how to love each other, to learn how to live into a community. And the dinner we had a few minutes ago, that agape meal, right? Agape is the Greek word for love. It's just another way. It's just another practice. That's really what our life as a church is all about. These practices, year after year, these long, crazy services that we do during Holy Week, they are all simply practices that teach us better and better how to fulfill Christ's mandate to us. It is not a mandate that he gives and says, you guys figure it out. Christ's mandate is one that he takes upon himself first. Christ is our example of how to love. Amen.